Thanks, James, and thanks to all of my steps, friends and colleagues for inviting me to speak at this symposium, of putting the symposium together. I think credibility across cultures is both a global and a very local phenomenon. Um, when we think about interdisciplinary um, uh, relationships in the kinds of issues that we're dealing with around expert knowledge um, and other forms of knowledge that might be relevant in these kind of issues. Um, I guess <coughs> the, um, the title who, or the question, whose expertise counts, um, I, I wanted, I was itching to actually insert, and I did start a PowerPoint, but my laptop crashed on me, and so I decided, no, I'm going to abandon it and uh, just talk. But um, I, I was itching to insert a second line, which was, uh, whose questions count? And it's interesting that actually the first session got to that issue right at the very end of the discussion. So in a way, I get queued up by them, thanks very much, uh, in terms of what kind of issues do we think we're actually dealing with when we're actually arguing over expertise or perhaps... Uh, lay expertise, as, um, as uh, I've called it, and others have called it too, uh, in considering these kind of issues. And I think it's worth maybe just starting with uh, one, uh, I mean, a set of understandings of the issue for which my, I'm probably best known in academic circles anyway, which is the interactions between Cumbrian sheep farmers and uh, various environmental radioactivity scientists in the aftermath of the Chernobyl um, fallout on, uh, on Britain and in particular on North Wales and the Lake District, the contamination of sheep in um, May, June of uh, 1986, which lasted far, far longer than the uh, scientific advisors were uh, saying at that time. Uh, with drastic effects on the credibility of the scientists and the policy makers um, and drastic effects on the farmers too. But um, w one of the ways in which my work on that has been interpreted is that Brian Wynne has shown that th the farmers knew better than the scientists. Rubbish. <laughs> um, that is not what uh, I was trying to say and I don't think I ever actually said it. What I did say was that the, sci the farmers knew better than the scientists about sheep farming, a rather different observation. The scientists knew better than the farmers about the science in which they were specialists. The problem for the policy was that it required both kinds of knowledge and probably other kinds of knowledge too, which weren't available, and they weren't actually being combined in any constructive way whatsoever. In fact, the farmer's knowledge was being ignored. And the farmer's knowledge also constituted something very important, and I've already uh, alluded to that, which is they were asking some relevant questions, which the scientists were also ignoring, and making observations even about scientific experiments which were being conducted on the fell sides, about, for example, the effectiveness of bentonite as a mineral, which might actually excrete the uh, radioactive contamination of the sheep more rapidly and therefore get them back beneath the action levels of contamination. So the idea that there is one knowledge or one question in these kinds of issues is of course something which no one would actually ever want to argue and yet it's so often in practiced and then actually affirmed often by academics too. So um, I don't need to name names here, I don't think, but some academic colleagues in my own field have interpreted my work as actually saying uh, that, in fact, the, um, the experts, the environmental radioactivity specialists, including some at my own university at Lancaster, um, and the farmers were actually dealing with the same problem and therefore there was some kind of direct comparative framework within which their expertises could be compared and uh, evaluated. Again, that is not true. They were operating in different problem worlds. 
And although there was a common element to it, which was contamination from Chernobyl and actually contamination from the Sellafield plant, which is just upwind from those same contaminated areas, the scientists were not dealing with the same questions that the farmers were dealing with. And that's very clearly documented in my work, and it has certain implications which are important when it comes to considering how policy and science actually interact with one another and where the authority comes from in terms of whose questions actually get to be addressed in the science which advisors then formulate for policy. So I want to argue then that this is the framing issue as uh, various colleagues in my own field have called it for donkey's years now. I think I started using that language in the late 80s and developed it through a variety of case studies. Um, uh, and the framing issue being essentially that which has now been recognised in many quarters, including by the USNRC's Understanding Risk Report in the late, late 90s, um, the late lamented Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, the same observations, that there are actually deliberative processes, inclusive processes, that involve policy questions, which therefore should in principle be conducted accountably, inclusively, deliberatively, democratically one might say, that those questions actually need to be addressed before one then poses those questions to the scientific experts. And of course that raises the further question about which are the relevant experts for those questions. Such a, an obvious question and that's such a neglected question when it comes to the relations of science and policy in these domains and then the critiques which come in on that science and policy and the responses to those critiques. So I want to stress something which um, again colleagues and friends at Spru and Steps and myself at Lancaster and others have been very much involved in which is actually trying to dissect risk assessment as a public science. Not in order to rubbish it and say don't believe the risk assessment but to pose questions which are about its, what I call its conditionalities. In other words, that laboratory toxicology may well be true in a laboratory with a pure chemical which is the active ingredient of the pesticide in question. Does that mean that that constitutes an adequate address to the risks of that chemical pesticide when it's been industrially produced with other kinds of byproducts in the industrial processes, like, for example, dioxins, known to be toxic and not very nice things. And when it's then delivered and practiced in farmers, other kinds of users like forestry workers, even local authority workers on motorway <coughs> sides and so on, when they are actually experiencing the risks as delivered in practice, where a whole variety of assumptions which are embedded within the laboratory science may be valid as in the laboratory with those specially bred rats and mice which have actually been bred so as to not have suffered any kind of damage to their immune systems or minimal damage to their immune systems. When the human beings for whom we're interested in the actual risks as delivered may not have anything like that kind of, as it were, response system to the agents which are actually being delivered and to which they're being exposed. Those kinds of questions about the relations between the laboratory and the real world, <coughs> again, have been accepted in principle, and yet the follow-through, the research, for example, and the risk assessments on multiple uh, cocktails of chemicals and indeed other factors too, is very, very, um, what should we say, embryonic. It's very primitive. It's at its very earliest stages. And so there are issues and question, questions there which ordinary people are often asking. And yet there's no real process for actually uh, integrating those questions with the practical experience, with the scientific expertise into the policy. So I want to just... Um, use the example of uh, GMOs and agriculture to indicate some of this kind of problem. In 2009, I was asked by the Food Standards Agency in the UK to take part in uh, 
uh, to be a member of the steering group of the public dialogue, as it was called, on GM uh, in food uh, in the UK and in the world. I said to the officials who first approached me, if it was going to be a dialogue about GM, I wasn't interested. If it was going to be a dialogue about global food and the role of GM in that, then it might get to be more interesting. And this was the time when Bob Watson was busy with IASTAD and the, uh, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. Um, and so I was actually interested in asking questions about how the issue is being framed. And what was very clear, and I eventually resigned, I was by then vice chair of the steering group, um, but I eventually resigned when the uh, chair of the Food Standards Agency came to a meeting just before we were due to sign contracts worth £500,000 worth of uh, taxpayers' money. Um, the chair of the FSA came to a meeting with us, the steering group of the, uh, uh, of the dialogue, and declared that GM is a scientific issue and the public is anti-science. So I, I, I couldn't believe my ears. I literally couldn't believe my ears. I was looking around the others around the table to see if they were having the same sense of shock that I was having. If the, if the GM issue is only a scientific issue and the public is anti-science, what is the point of having a public dialogue? It was just completely nonsensical. I thought it was Alice in Wonderland. So um, I resigned. And the, the reason that I resigned mainly... There were several other reasons, actually, about whether the dialogue met. Science-wise, is the government's own expert authority on public dialogue on issues like this involving science, but not scientific issues. They're public issues involving science, which is a very different thing. Because if we call them scientific issues, we exclude important questions which aren't only scientific. And which in the case of GM, for instance, and which the EASTED report did its very best to deal with and address and raise, have to do with things like who actually owns and controls the key resources of the global food chain. And if that is increasingly concentrating, three factors mainly, we think about them, land, knowledge and seeds or germplasm. The diversity of germplasm is something which is a crucial part of global food security, sustainability of that global food access. And um, in, in this case, we can see, and there are documented in the literature, concentration is going on, even also in the issue of land, in the following way. The World Economic Forum last year, at its Davos meeting uh, in 2012, actually had a report on the table on sustainable agriculture for the world <coughs> where they projected forward from 2010, decade to, to 2030, and where the total production of global... This is cereals and pulses, basically. Um, increased by 20% um, per decade uh, from about 4 billion tonnes to about 5.5 billion tonnes from 2010 to 2030. The contributions of small farming, smallholder farming, to these totals and large industrial high-tech farming, high-input farming as well, high chemicals and fertilizer energy inputs, the smallholder farmers have disappeared by 2030. The industrial large-scale farming had increased from about 1.3 billion to 4 billion and had taken over the whole of agricultural production. That is not a scientific issue. It's a political issue, and it's a social and cultural issue. What are we assuming there about the world? And we go back then to those discredited development models from the post-war years, where we assume when we actually just throw such infinite numbers of people off the land and all of their knowledge that goes with it, that they will somehow gain jobs in what? In the IT industry or something, which will develop from 
the conversion of that agriculture into global market agriculture with cash returns and therefore new investments. That's the model that's still being operated. And I question whether that's a sustainable model even biologically and agriculturally given the inputs which it requires. But then is that a viable model socially? The point is that these kinds of policy questions are not only scientific issues. They are science involving and those scientific questions are very important. But they're not only scientific. And the way that the GM issue is being handled at the moment is interesting in this respect because I want to suggest that science is actually playing a, a new role which is, has crept up on us almost unnoticed and certainly unaddressed in terms of its policy implications where it's not only informing policy, giving the best facts that we can to the, to the policy world to get the best policies, it's actually defining the meaning of the public issues. Not just GM, but other issues too become scientific issues. And that means risk issues. And then there's a huge amount of orchestrated effort to control the interpretation and definition of risk. So what counters the relevant questions for the resolution of those issues, the only issues as it's defined, is actually very highly controlled. I could give examples, I can come back to that in the discussion if, uh, if it's appropriate. So uh, I stop there. I want to say that we're actually into a kind of culture of scientism <coughs> which is deeply problematic and which is actually narrowing the options available to the world at large and indeed to science itself. We're not actually exploiting the flexibility and the versatility and the potential of scientific research in the way that this is being controlled at the present time. I'll stop there, thank you.